Noriel Rubini, Professor Emeritus of Economics at NYU Stern and author of the new book, Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them, which I should note was named one of the Financial Times Best Business Books of 2022. Noriel, it is so great to see you and great to welcome you to the show. Thanks for joining me. Uh, great being with you today, Julia. It's great, great, pleasure. great to see you and great to be with you as well. And you're one of my favorite interviews. So I'm so excited to have this extended conversation with you about your new book, which I read twice, by the way. And I think it's an incredibly important book. I agree with the Financial Times, naming it one of the best books of the year. And um, I think it's incredibly timely. So I was kind of just hoping, Noriel, we can start with a bit of the genesis of the book. If I had to guess, it probably goes back to the pandemic for you, which was what made you want to write this book. Help us understand um, how you were starting to piece together these 10 mega threats and why you wanted to write this book. Yes, the conception of the book uh, occurred uh, during the pandemics. Um, for one, I, I was stuck in New York at home. Uh, I was not traveling as much as before. I was doing Zoom talks and calls, but I was reflecting on the fact that uh, Usually we think about uh, traditional economic and financial cycles, and then stuff that is unexpected can occur. And certainly we've had uh, global pandemics before, but nothing uh, as severe as the COVID-19. And then I was thinking of the world we live one, is one in which uh, there is a severe global climate change is becoming increasingly damaging was the beginning of a Cold War between US and China, but there was a broader geopolitical depression. There was a beginning of trends uh, towards uh, trade wars and fragmentation and deglobalization. Uh, we saw this backlash against liberal democracy as throughout the world more radical populist uh, parties of the extreme right and left were coming to power. And then of course there were not only the traditional economic, monetary, and financial risks, but I saw the emergence of stuff that had not been an issue for a few decades. I mean, until 2000, we were worrying about inflation being too low in US and advanced economies. We could barely reach 2%. Then we had these uh, factors on the demand and supply side that led to inflation and close to double digit. Um, I'm old enough to remember the 70s where we had a stagflation, recession and inflation at the same time. Usually that's not supposed to be happening in economics. Either you have a overheating economy, too much demand and inflation, strong growth and inflation, or you have recession and deflation. But having a recession and inflation requires to think about negative supply shocks that are stagflationary. And then I looked at the mountain of private and public debt, implicit and explicit, and figure out that with rising inflation, rising interest rates, then that will become uh, unsustainable. And I realize you have to connect all these dots together. These are not uh, separate mega threats, but each one of them affects the other and is affected back. It's like a 10 by 10, by 10 matrix. I call them mega threats. Folks like the economist and historian Adam Tooze and others call it holy crisis, or the head of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, last spring at the IMF meeting, called it uh, a confluence of calamities, a bit alliterative. And uh, she said that the world economy was facing is the biggest test since uh, World War II. So the label, whether it's mega threats or poly crisis or confluence of calamities, doesn't matter. It refers to the fact that there are new, significant and radically different threats from the past, and they're all connected to each other. And they threaten not only our jobs, not only our incomes, not only our savings and wealth, they threaten our health, the health of the planet, and even the survival of our own species uh, as Homo sapiens. They could be threatened by a nuclear winter if there was a World War III, or threatened by eventually AI becoming so super intelligent that then Homo sapiens becomes obsolete. So it's a bit of a shift compared to the past. Yeah. Like these aren't just 
your ordinary run of the mill risks, as you put them, they are threats, mega threats, um, and they yeah. can cause yeah. severe uh, harm and misery. Um, I want to give folks a little bit of context about you. I think a lot of people are familiar with you, but just real quick for the listeners and viewers, um, you know, Norio, uh, in 2006, you called um, out housing prices being at stratospheric uh, levels. You called out the dangerous levels of mortgage debt, the overbuilding that was taking place. You warned of this historic bubble and the impending global recession and the financial crisis. I just want to put that out for folks to understand a bit about um, who you are and what you've seen. And you don't this is you don't take this lightly. Th these are really serious threats. So let's start to tick through some of them. Uh, you were just mentioning um, the kind of mother of all debt crises. Can you help us understand? The, the picture maybe globally as it relates to debt and even here domestically in the U.S. and why you kind of see this kind of mother of all debt crises coming? Yes, uh, chapter one of my book, Mega Threats, is devoted to what I refer to as the mother of all debt crisis. Um, if you look at the amounts of uh, debt, both private and public, uh, domestic and external, um, globally, and private uh, debt refers to the debt of the households, the debt of the business, corporate sector, and the debt of uh, financial institution, whether they're banks or broker dealers or shadow banks, it doesn't matter. Uh, that ratio as a share of output, GDP or income, in the early 1970s globally was 100% of GDP. Uh, by 1999 was slightly above 200% uh, of GDP. Last year was about 350% uh, of GDP and rising. In advanced economy, the number is more like 420% of GDP and rising. In China, 330% of GDP and rising. In the US, today, the sum of private and public debt as a share of GDP is higher than its peak during the Great Depression, and it's peak after World War II, when we borrowed a lot because of the war. And right now, we're not coming out of a Great Depression. We're not coming out of a global war, but the debt ratios are higher. Now, when debts are high, eventually people get bankrupt, right? Uh, houses, individuals can go bankrupt. Firms, businesses can go bankrupt. Banks can go bankrupt, government can default, we call it sovereign debt, or entire country, they can default on their foreign debt, foreign debt of the private and public sector owed to non-residents. But uh, we didn't have a severe global debt crisis because uh, during the global financial crisis, we had a huge debt problem, but uh, there was a negative uh, demand shock, uh, credit crunch, that led to fall in output, fall in demand, and uh, deflation, right, during the GFC. And once we had deflation to prevent uh, deflation from setting in and the Great Recession becoming Great Depression 2.0, we went from, uh, uh, you know, 5% interest rates to zero. In Europe and Japan, negative. We did quantitative easing that meant to buy uh, long-term U.S. Uh, and other countries' bonds, reducing the interest rates on the long-term bonds. We did credit easing that meant buying private assets, high-yield, high-grade bonds, or other commercial paper, money market, reducing the interest on them. And therefore, any agent that was insolvent, because there were plenty of insolvent or zombie households, banks, corporates, shadow banks, governments, uh, countries, got bailed out. Not everybody. During the GFC, of course, many went, banks went bust, many households went bust and lost their homes. But we had a bailout, and we did another big bailout, actually bigger than the, during the GFC, uh, at the beginning of the COVID crisis. So the beginning of the COVID crisis, demand fell more sharply than supply. So for a few months, actually, we're back to deflation. So the monetary, fiscal, and credit easing and stimulus was an order of magnitude more bigger than during the GFC, because initially we had deflation. So uh, all institutions, private and public, that were insolvent, zombie, uh, they did not default. 
if anything, during COVID, they borrowed even more because money was so cheap. Say so in US before COVID, the Fed was worried about uh, corporate debt and about shadow banks. During the GFC was households and uh, uh, banks. Uh, but during COVID, before COVID, was corporates and shadow banks that borrowed too much. High yield, high grade, fallen angels. Those were borderline between investment grade and not investment grade. CLOs, leverage loans, private debt, all of done in reckless uh, underwriting like Cov Light and you name it. And the Fed was writing financial stability reports before COVID, worrying about the risk of a corporate debt crisis. Not only this zombie corporate did not go bankrupt, we bailed them out and they borrowed more during the COVID crisis because money was so cheap and they had all the PPP loans that pretty much everybody could get. Household, corporates, businesses, you name it. This time around, the world is different because uh, the debt levels in the past were high, but the debt servicing ratios, the interest you had to pay on your debt was very low. In Europe and Japan, even negative for public debt as the nominal interest rates on the debt was negative uh, for a while. $18 trillion equivalent of government debt in Europe and Japan had the negative nominal yield. Even mortgages in Denmark had the negative nominal yield. So you can be bankrupt if you're paying zero or negative interest rates on your debt, you can survive. Today is different because a, a number of factors on the demand and supply side are leading to higher inflation. Since central banks have to fight inflation, they have to increase interest rates. So the interest rate you pay on your mortgages or your student loans or your credit card or your auto loans or your personal loans or your shark loans or the interest rate you pay on your bank loans for a business and a corporation on your bonds or your other private debt is rising. And therefore, and for some governments that have a lot of public debt, the interest on their debt is rising and so on and so on. So the zombies this time around, they're not going to be bailed out. They're not going to survive. And there will be a severe debt crisis as debt servicing ratios hit you at the time where it's a triple whammy. It's not just the interest on your unsustainable debt is going up. The value of your assets is falling. This year we had a massive correction in public equity, private equities, growth stocks, tech stocks, VC stocks, bubble like the Mimi, crypto, stock went bust, public REITs fell in value, housing more. Values are falling, government bonds fell in price, yield went higher, credit spreads widened, the price of those got down, even cash made you lose money in real terms because of inflation. So you have a shock to your debt servicing ability. You have a shock to the value of your assets. And those firms and individuals that are strained, they have a shock to their p &L, their income. Revenues of some firms is falling. Some houses are going to be at risk of losing jobs and becoming unemployed and having a crunch. So it becomes like a trifecta. Shock to your income, shock to your debt servicing, shock to your assets. And that's a, that's a perfect storm if this recession is going to be severe rather than short and shallow. And if rising and increasing interest is going to lead to further severe increases in debt servicing ratios. Yeah. As you put it, a, a perfect storm. And I think this, you said a shock to your income, shock to your debt servicing, shock to the value of your assets. Ha yeah. ha have we seen something... Is there an example of this in history or have you, is there like a period you would analogize this to? Or is this like kind of unchartered, like this kind of scenario, this kind of perfect storm, as you put it? Um, well, we've had other situations like during the GFC where asset prices were falling. Stock market was falling. The value of your homes was falling. Uh, incomes were falling because there was a recession. Uh, but then... Uh, those who had high debt ratios, um, some of them went bankrupt because even with zero rates and so on uh, and quantity easing, if you could not pay your mortgage, you still lost your home. So there were distress on the debt side, but was not across the board. Those households that had too much debt and didn't have much equity went bust. Those banks were highly leveraged went bust. But those institutions, uh, be it uh, corporations, governments and the parts of the household sector that actually 
were in better financial health benefited from falling interest rates. The interest rate they had to pay on their mortgages or personal loans or business loans fell because there was a demand shock, there was deflation, and we cut rates to zero or negative, and we did quantitative and credit easing. So there was a debt servicing shock only for those that are, were highly indebted. And of course, for them, even zero rates did not matter because the spread you were paying on your debt was high. Uh, but everybody else actually had that debt servicing relief. And in the typical recession, you have a shock to your income. You have a shock to the value of your assets. But if there is a, a recession that is driven by a negative shock to demand, you have a lower inflation. Central bank is monetary fiscal credit easing. And then you get uh, relief on, uh, on the debt side of your balance sheet, even if you have a hit on to, to the income side and to the asset. Well, when inflation is rising, you have a hit to your income, to the value of your assets, and to the debt servicing cost of your liabilities. So in that sense, you have to go back to the 70s. But in the 70s, we had negative supply shock like today that were stagflationary, the two old shocks of 73 and 79. But debt ratios in advanced economies were low. So we had stagflation, recession, unemployment, misery indexed high, but we didn't have a debt crisis in advanced economies. We had a debt crisis in Latin America because all these countries that borrowed like crazy in the 70s, and when then Volcker had to jack up uh, the Fed funds rate to 20% to fight inflation, of course, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina defaulted, went bankrupt. But we didn't have a debt crisis in the US and Europe. After the GFC, we had a debt problem, too much debt, household, mortgages, banks. Uh, but we had a negative demand shock and a credit crunch that led to deflation. So we cut interest rates, and therefore uh, we didn't have an inflation problem. We had a deflation problem, even if we had a debt problem. Today, instead, we have the worst of the 70s, because now you have a whole bunch of negative supply shocks that are reducing growth, increasing inflation, and you have debt ratios that are even higher than they were before the global financial crisis, and even higher than they were before the COVID crisis. That's why I worry that the great moderation is over, and not only will we have inflation, not only will we have stagflation, but we'll have a stagflationary debt crisis, inflation, mm -hmm recession and a debt crisis. It's different from the 70s, different from the post-GFC uh, period. Got it. Yeah, the, the, as you put it, like the conditions are ripe for that uh, sort of scenario. Um, stagflation, recession, high unemployment, high inflation. On the inflation part, because we, we're we recording this, uh, it's December 20th as we're recording this. So um, last week we got the November CPI, I think cooler than, it was cooler than expected. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts, Noriel, on, on inflation um, and the Federal Reserve's uh, rate hikes. Do you think, what are your thoughts on inflation? And do you think that with the Fed's rate hikes, is there a path to getting back to that 2% target? Or do you think we'll see, I guess, a higher level? would love to hear uh, your thoughts. Well, inflation for now has peaked, but it's peaked at a very high level and it's falling. But you know, even at seven, it's too high. I mean, Eurozone UK is closer to nine, 10. So it may fall further because of base effects and so on, but say, Going from 9.10 towards uh, 5.6 is the easy side. The question is whether we can go back to 2 without a hard landing or not. And in U.S. history, we have never had the situation where inflation is above uh, 5%, right now 7.1. Unemployment below 5%, right now is 3.7. Then the Fed starts hiking rates and you get a soft landing. You always get a hard landing, a recession. Uh, same thing in Europe and the UK. Actually, Europe and the UK are already in a recession, officially, practically, and they're already in a stagflation. US is not yet in a recession, but we're getting close to it given the forward-looking uh, economic indicator. So at this point, the debate is not anymore on soft versus hard landing, but only whether this is going to be a short and shallow recession uh, that's a conventional wisdom. Uh, we're going to have a couple of quarters of negative growth. 
then inflation drops like a stone, wage inflation, and then the Fed can ease again by the second half of the year. So, so effectively, it's a softish landing or a hard landing that is really mild. Uh, I don't believe it's going to be short and shallow, in part because they have these debt problems, and once you raise interest rates, you get a financial stress that feeds on the economic and vice versa. But uh, uh, unlikely we're going to have a real soft landing. And in my view, we're not even going to get a softish landing. It will be a more severe and protracted uh, recession, given the debt problems that we have right now. <clears throat> So you you're not you don't you don't see the scenario for the soft landing. Is that what I'm that's what I'm hearing? <clears throat> well, a true soft landing means you get to two percent without any recession. I think that's totally far fetched. Uh, UK, even the Bank of England is expecting five consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. In the eurozone, Q4 is going to be negative. Q1 is going to be negative. Technically, is a recession. But uh, people say, well, it's not a true hard landing because it's only a couple of quarters of growth and then uh, you recover. It's, a, it's not a soft landing, it's a softish landing or some landing with some pain, but big deal. Two quarters of negative growth, slight increase in unemployment rate, not such a big deal. So the issue is whether it's going to be a short and shallow recession or a more severe. At this, at this point, the consensus will have a short and shallow recession. No one is really thinking of a true soft landing. Uh, not for Europe, certainly, and increasingly so even for the United States. Even the Fed says softish rather than soft. No. Uh, so the consensus moved from soft landing to um, short and shallow recession. I'm saying it's not going to be short and shallow for a variety of reasons. And uh, I think there are, in the book, by the way, leaving aside the short term, the key point about the book is that even if those short term uh, negative supply shocks were to disappear. The impact of COVID on uh, supply of goods, of labor, global supply chains, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and impact on commodity prices and the zero COVID policy of China. In the book in chapter five on the great stagflation, I identify 11 separate factors that reduce potential growth and increase the cost of production. So there are 11 negative aggregate supply shocks that are all stagflationary. And together with loose monetary and fiscal policy, uh, that leads you to stagflation. And we're gonna have loose monetary and fiscal policy because there is so much debt in the system that not only we have the traditional, uh, uh, what's called fiscal dominance, that means that in a game of chicken between a fiscal and a monetary authority, there's too much debt and deficits, the monetary has to blink because otherwise you get a spike in interest rates and a debt crisis. But there is a broader, more than public debt, there is also private debt. So the economists at the Bank for International Settlement, the central bank of all central banks in Basel, they call it the debt trap. There's so much private and public debt as a share of GDP, as I said, gone from 100% to 420 in advanced economies, that when you raise rates, not only you get a hard landing and a real hard landing with a severe recession, then you get a crash in the stock market, a crash in the bond market, a crash in the credit markets. And that tightening of financial condition makes a recession more severe. And a more severe recession makes that uh, worsening of financial and debt distress more severe. They feed on each other. Then you get an economic and financial crash. And faced with the risk of an economic and financial crash and a debt trap, my view is central banks that today say we're going to fight inflation at any cost, they're going to blink, they're going to wimp out, and they'll have to accept higher inflation because the consequence of going all the way to two and leading to an economic and financial collapse will not be economically nor politically acceptable anywhere. Yeah, as you, as you put, they'll have to blink or um, wimp out because, yeah, like the I think you in the book you described it as like the easy money trap, um, you know, where... Um, you'll see the bankruptcy of medium-sized banks or government institu government institutions or zo zombie companies um, and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Another area, there's so many areas here to talk about. Um, another area of the book uh, that you brought up was this demographic time bomb, and I'd love for you to explain um, that threat and what you're looking for there. 
Well, um, if you look at governments, you have their explicit debt, right? They issue bonds and uh, public debt as a share of GDP. It's about 100 percent of GDP in advanced economies and rising higher in Italy, slightly smaller in Germany, but everybody's getting towards 100 percent plus. But there is also what people call implicit debt or unfunded liability coming from aging. In our system of social security, this pays you go, the payroll taxes of the young workers pay for the benefits of the old. And the same thing for Medicare. But uh, if you have a young and growing population of workers and you have a relatively small number of elderly, then uh, those payroll taxes can pay for the benefits of the early. But when you have a rapid aging of population, you have less young workers, you have a growing number of elderly, and therefore the Social Security Trust Fund that is right now a few trillion dollars is gonna be run down. And once it goes to zero, the benefits we promised to the elderly cannot be paid anymore with the payroll taxes of the young. That's what we call unfunded liability coming from aging or implicit debt. And there are estimates that for US and other advanced economies, this implicit debt as a share of GDP, given the current uh, payroll taxes, retirement age, and benefits promised to the elderly, is about 100% of GDP. So it's as big as the explicit debt. Now, in the past, we could in part address this implicit debt if we didn't have enough fertility and young people and aging with migration because migration increases the labor supply and these migrants work, they pay taxes. Many of them even pay payroll taxes because they hope that eventually they're gonna be regularized. And therefore migration prevents uh, what's happening with aging. But now there's a political backlash against migration in US, in UK, in Europe, for many reasons, right or wrong as they might be. Let's say the migration policy of the Biden administration are no different than those of Trump on a substance of it. You know, when there are too many people trying to come illegally in the country, we are restricted. Even if migrants have benefited in terms of growth, entrepreneurship, and so on, the country. There's a concern that they may crowd out uh, a variety of public services like housing, hospitals, healthcare, education, leaving aside those who are racist, who don't like people that don't look like you, don't have your culture, your religion, your skin color, and so on. But there is a backlash. By the way, today is only a million or two here and there that are coming. Because of climate change, you'll have hundreds of millions of people have to move in the next 10, 20 years. So if you're worried about a few Central Americans or Mexicans coming to the U.S., wait until massive desertification and climate change pushes hundreds of millions knocking at your doors. Those restrictions are going to become even more severe. So uh, it's a time bomb because we have explicit debt and we have implicit debt. And the solution migration now is politically unacceptable. And with AI and robotic automation, we'll also have massive amounts of uh, technological unemployment that's going to lead us also not to want to have uh, uh, many people competing for more scarce jobs. So th that's what uh, a demographic does to you. I'm going to ask you about AI um, at some point, but I have a, a follow-on question um, around the demographic time bomb. Because you're talking about like the the unfunded liabilities and like the younger generations really have to really have to bear uh, that. And does it get to some point where like the younger generations are going to get fed up with it because they feel like it's going to be? I, I've heard it described as like intragenerational theft. Is that a risk to think about as well? Uh, there is a <clears throat> intergenerational conflict between uh, young and old. One dimension of it is, yes, uh, the payroll taxes of the young now pay for the benefits of the recently retired. But the time these young people are going to retire and they pay those these payroll taxes, uh, the trust fund is gone. And the benefits that they get is going to be, uh, depending on the scenario, 80 or 70 or 60 percent of what is promised today, because there's not going to be enough young people to pay for their benefits. That's one conflict. The other conflict is we run budget deficits. When you run the deficit, you should debt. You're spending more today. You're issuing debt that somebody in the future has to pay. 
and most of this deficit goes for benefits for the elderly people, social safety net, health care, uh, Medicare, social security, you name it. Uh, the young get less of that, but the young will be those left with the debt that has to be repaid when in the future they are older. So they're going to have a problem both in terms of the implicit debt and explicit debt. We're polluting the environment. I'm 64. I'd be lucky if I live another 30 years. But if you're a person born today in the US, your life expectancy at birth is about 100 years. It could be 110 or 20 by the time you retire given by medical developments. Uh, you'll have to bear the consequences of, of, uh, of global climate change, for example. Right. So there are all these things that imply that we're essentially damaging our economy, our environment, our health and so on in the short run. And the costs are going to be paid by those who are around uh, in the long run. The elderly are not going to be around. The young are going to be around. So there is a what you call intergenerational theft that implies uh, intergenerational tensions. Trouble is that in the U.S., uh, the young don't tend to vote. They all tend to vote. So whether it's this issue uh, of the environment as opposed to other ones, uh, uh, we're not following policies that are to the benefit of the young as opposed to the elderly. Yeah. All right. Um, on the artificial intelligence uh, part as a mega threat, uh, you're talking about, yeah, you know, like historically there's a technology that's evolved and, you know, people kind of adapt with the technology. But you really see um, a bigger risk from artificial intelligence um, as it relates to job displacement. Would love to hear your views there. Yeah, in the past, when there was productivity growth in agriculture, uh, jobs in the primary agriculture sector disappeared. People moved into the industry. And when then uh, jobs in industry fell because of productivity growth, people went into the service sector. The point is that AI is not only displacing routine jobs that used to be blue collar, robotic automation in the factory, but now most uh, white collar jobs that are more cognitive jobs can be sliced into a series of tasks. And each of these tasks can be uh, automated, right? I mean, there is today even a barista robot that can do your latte four times faster and as good as any barista. Uh, there are chef uh, robots. I was just in uh, Washington where in the lobby of my hotel, there was a butler, a butler robot. You order some food and the butler takes it to your room. It's a robot rather than a service person. So any job, whether it's transportation with autonomous vehicles, education, public services, uh, you know, retail, even chefs can be gradually automated. And now with the revolution of transformers and chat GPT and you name it, even creative jobs uh, can be displaced. I mean, today, among the other things I do, I don't only predict the long run, I have daily to figure out what the Fed, ECB, BOE, Bank of Japan do. So there are tons of Fed watchers. And usually they can do it better than a machine, but it's not only a matter of time when, uh, uh, you know, an AI takes every economic data, every economic model, every econometric model, every speech and statement by a Fed official, every aspect of the global economy, uh, every reaction function historically of the Fed. And this robot or AI is going to make a better prediction, not only of what the Fed will do, but even of the statement of the Fed and the presser by Powell better than any Fed watcher. It's a matter of time. And these jobs, you know, Goldman Sachs, probably the top Fed watcher, gets paid a million dollars. Same thing at JP Morgan or City, right? Those are highly priced jobs within, uh, within uh, the financial sector and Wall Street and City. These are not uh, routine jobs. They're not cognitive jobs. They're really creative jobs. People will make a million dollar a year. Uh, those jobs will be gone. It's a matter of time. Yeah. My job as a Fed watcher, give it 10 years, it's going to be obsolete, guaranteed. This is the pace of what's happening yeah. right now. It's a bit of a revolution. Yeah. Plus, the economic pie may become much bigger, growth may become much bigger, but one, you're going to have 
permanent technological unemployment. Initially, for people with low skills or medium skills, blue collar and white collar, eventually for everybody. Two, you get uh, uh, a massive increase in income and wealth inequality because these the innovations are capital intensive, skill buys and labor saving. So if you own the machine, the robots, the AI, or the financial capitals own it, you're gonna do well. If you're in the top 10% distribution of skills, education, human capital, like you and me, and hopefully many of our listeners and watchers, you're gonna do fine for the time the AI makes you more productive. A banker, an economist, a lawyer, a doctor, a surgeon, uh, you name it, even a trader. But if you are a low value added or medium value added blue collar and white collar worker, gradually your jobs and your income is going to be displaced by the robots and the machines on a permanent basis. So inequality is going to arise. Now, people say, well, we have a solution. The economic pie is so big that we can tax the winners, those who are lucky or winners or smarter, and redistribute to those who are left behind, either in the form of universal basic income, UBI, or universal provision of public services. Same thing, right? We you free education, healthcare, pension, you name it, and so on. The trouble with that solution is that people don't want to live a life with a welfare check. They want to have a dignity of work, of feeling they're productive members of society. If you're gonna give a check and for the rest of your life, you're gonna essentially do nothing, it solves the problem in the short run. One is politically not very feasible in the long run. Two people become restless. And we have an example of what happens when you do that. Today, there is a vast, uh, mostly white underclass, is what Angus Deaton and Anne Case in their book called the debts of despair. A whole generation of millions of uh, young Americans that are skillless, jobless, helpless, hopeless, and so on. What do they do all, the, all day long? There is a welfare check. They play video games and they live in virtual reality, right? Many of them get addicted to opioids. There are 2 million people in the US who are addicted to opioids. 5% of them dies every year. That's why we have 100,000 deaths from overdoses, mostly opioids. And they don't even have a girlfriend. They cannot mate because they are really left behind. And what are they? They are incels, right? Involuntary celibates. Young, angry men that sometimes they take a gun and they start shooting. And many of these recent mass shootings have been these incels. They're angry towards women. And eventually they're not gonna reproduce themselves because they don't have a mate. So give it one or two generations, these deaths of despair, they die either of drugs or boredom or because they cannot reproduce themselves. So eventually this UBI solution is one that says those who are left behind uh, through a Malthusian process are going to disappear, most, most of humanity. That's not exactly a utopian future, right? Yeah. No, and no. even those who are more successful, eventually the machine, eventually the machine is going to be super intelligent. So even the top 10%, even the 1% is going to be not smart enough compared to the machine. I mean, sapiens, our species, is going to disappear for sure. The only question is not whether it's going to disappear, but whether it's going to happen in 50 years or 100 years or more or less. We're not going to be the last step of human civilization. You know, before Sapiens, there was uh, Neanderthal or Erectus or Denisovian. And by the way, we're the only species that destroys the previous version of the species. We come from apes, you know, and among apes, the gorilla is the strongest, but the chimps and the bonobos who are small and weaker live happily among the gorillas. But uh, but sapiens uh, killed Neanderthal and Neanderthal killed Erectus and Erectus killed Denisovian. They all disappeared. Hominoids are the only species. And sapiens is 150,000 years, right? Uh, we're less than a footnote in the history of this life on this planet, 3.5 billion years. So who said that we are the last step of, uh, unquote, uh, humanity. Eventually, there'll be Homo Deus or Femina Deus or Femina Bionicus, and it's going to replace Sapiens. That's going to happen for sure. 
That's guaranteed. It's only a matter of time. But it's also dystopian because only a very small fraction of humanity is going to be able to have the financial means to become bionic, to become immortal, to upload their own memory and consciousness into a bionic body and live forever. Everybody else is going to disappear. So it's a pretty dark... Uh, if you read the book by Yuval Harari on Homo Deus, that, uh, that, uh, that future is not utopian, it's dystopian. So we're headed there. It's just a matter of when, not whether. Yeah, very dystopian. Well, I don't think I'd want to be here with a bunch of people who are like bionic elitists. Well, you're young the enough yeah. that you might be there when that revolution occurs. Yeah. I'm old enough that, you know, it's not going to happen in the next 30 years, yeah. but you, you're going to live for another six, seven decades or more. So you could be facing the, the, the option of either upgrading yourself or otherwise becoming obsolete. It could happen in your lifetime. I would not rule it out. That's crazy to think about. Um, I take it you've played around with, um, back to AI, chat GPT, because, I mean, it's pretty incredible. Like, when you're using it, I'm kind of thinking, yeah. oh, my gosh. Like, as someone who studied journalism, you know, it's, yeah. like, I, I don't know. Like, it, it, it was kind of, uh, it's cool at the same time, but it's also frightening at the same time. And you're talking yeah. about, like, a Fed watcher might not have their job. Maybe a journalist wouldn't have their job. Um, so um, most, guess, uh, most articles can be already written by a machine. And so it's earning good. reports of any company, you take the the you know the data, you can put it into a, an article that is written as well by any analyst. Yeah, absolutely. Already been done today. Many journalist jobs can be done by a machine. Yeah, it's going to be more so. You'd have to break, start like really breaking um, stories, I suppose. Like, let me just ask you yeah. though, because if you were going to talk to like a young person, let's say it's a college age person, or maybe someone who's a parent and they have kids today, what would you say to them or what would you advise them? Um, because it sounds like the younger generations are really going to have to inherit uh, this confluence of mega threats if they uh, play yeah. out as you predict. Well, if you are a young uh, person, man or woman, and going to college, then you have to ask yourself, what should I study not to become completely obsolete? And probably, given the trends, I would say you should major in something related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, computer science, but also have a minor in liberal arts because, you know, if you have to change jobs every few years because your career is going to be disrupted by technology, knowing how to read well, write well, think well, and be critical mind, probably is going to be useful. So either you major in one and mine or the other, or vice versa. Uh, eventually, you might still become obsolete. Even PhD jobs are going to be replaced by technology. But you'll have more leeway for longer to try to be in the top uh, 1% to 10%, as opposed to in the bottom uh, uh, 50% uh, for, for at least for at least a while. So that, that's what I would suggest. Secondly, I would tell any young person, I know what's happening right now. Uh, you feel like you're, you barely make it paycheck to paycheck and you want to be gambling for redemption. That's why so many young people go into crypto or meme stocks or SPACs or you name it, day trading. One out of a thousand becomes rich gambling that this way and trading. 99.9% .9 of people lose their shirts. The only way to have enough uh, financial safety for, say, retirement is one, you study hard. Two, you work hard in whatever job. Three, you retrain yourself because probably any jobs you have is going to become obsolete. So you have to be flexible to learn all your life. Four, even if you feel like you're living from paycheck to paycheck, you save 10 to 20% of your income, whatever the income is, because Social Security is not going to be there for you. Or it's going to be only a fraction of it. And, you know, everybody has too many shirts or too many pieces of clothes or too many pieces of junk. The idea we, we cannot uh, save is not true. You save and you save in a diversified portfolio, U.S. and global assets. You don't go and gamble on crypto or Mimi or other stupid things. Buy and hold, passive, don't try to gamble and become rich overnight. And if you have an entrepreneurial idea, maybe you're going to try to develop that one. Uh, you'll be lucky if you're the next unicorn, even if you're not the next unicorn, you could have a business idea that maybe makes sense. Try to have enough income so you can also 
have uh, the option of becoming an entrepreneur, but also the option of having a job that is not entrepreneurial if things uh, entrepreneurship-wise uh, fail, because nine out of 10 of all startups fail. And, uh, and then slowly, slowly, probably you're going to do better than the most. Uh, gradually over time, you're not going to become rich overnight. Uh, you're not going to be the unicorn. One out of a million becomes a unicorn. Uh, but maybe you're more able to survive the kind of uh, mega threats that you're going to be facing. And of course, you have to live in a place that's not going to be destroyed by the environment. You have to be also getting caring about not only your own personal welfare, but being involved in society because many of these collective problems cannot be resolved individually. There's no individual exemption. You're going to have another nuclear winter. You're going to have another massive disaster on the climate. You're going to have another pandemic. Even the smartest and the most uh, careful could be swept away. So you have to be involved socially and politically in making this world for the better because we either swim or sink together. And step by step, if more people behave that way, maybe younger generation can help uh, move in the direction, in the right direction for this world. Otherwise, we're doomed. Yeah. So it's good um, pragmatic advice for uh, younger folks. Uh, you mentioned, I, I wasn't even going to bring it up, but since you mentioned it, um, because a lot of it was like, you know, um, as you put it, kind of like gambling, uh, whether it was like the meme stocks or cryptocurrencies. Uh, and this is kind of maybe a bit of an aside to the broader conversation. What are your thoughts on the cryptocurrency space, especially in light of the SBF FTX fiasco that we've seen? Do you have like updated thoughts on cryptocurrencies? You know, I've been public enemy number one of crypto since 2017. And unlike, unlike many people then say, well, there is some future about crypto or blockchain. I stuck with my view that is all uh, uh, the mother of all bubbles and the mother of all scams. You know, I've studied financial history, never seen a case in which there is so much really fraud, but not SDF. 99% of crypto is a fraud. I mean, criminality bunch of crooks, criminals, conmen, carnival barkers, and really scammers. That's what they are. Leaving aside that these cryptocurrencies are not currencies. Anybody who knows anything about currencies, no, they're not. They're not a unit of account. They're not a scalable means of payment. They're not a stable store of value. They're not a single doomer. Calling them currencies is just a misnomer. You know, 80% of all ICOs, and there were 20,000 ICOs, were a scam in the first place, criminal scam. The SEC created a parody website to show how people take a white paper, cut and paste, and put a different name to it and create another uh, ICO. 80% of them were a scam. Another 17% have lost all of their value. So 97% of them, or about 19,300 out of 20,000, whether a criminal enterprise or a scam, they took the money. What did they do with the money? They bought Lamborghinis. They bought villas in Miami or the Caribbean. They bought boats. They bought planes. They were literally paying millions of dollars for escorts and prostitutes. All those strip clubs in Miami, their articles, were making millions of dollars last year on the crypto guys. And they, and they were corrupt. And they were evading taxes going to the Caribbean or Puerto Rico and so on. This is outright criminality. It's not just a bubble. This is a bunch of crooks, 99% of them. SBF is not the exception, is the rule. Pretty much all of them are this way. Bunch of crooks pretending, at least, you know, Gordon Gecko, he was greedy. Remember Wall Street, the movie? He said, greed is good. He was not pretending to want to save the world, to bank the unbanked, to give ID to the poor or the refugees. They wrap themselves around we want to save the world and poverty and inclusive stuff and, uh, and effective altruism. It's all a pretense. They're a bunch of hypocrites who are just greedy, corrupt, criminal crooks. They should all be in jail. All of them should be in jail, not just SBF. It's really the rule. They're all the same. And they've created the mother of all scams, the mother of all bubbles that now has gone bust. And last year, Bitcoin lost 80% of its value, Ethereum 80%, the other top 10, 85%. 
the other ones, 90%. And 97% of them were a scam or they went to zero already. 20,000. We're speaking about the biggest financial fraud in human history. You know, during the internet, lots of things go bust. But, you know, there were 20 pet.com, 17 out of 20 went bust. But the idea of selling pet food online is totally legitimate. Millions of Americans have cats and dogs and they love them. So the logic of doing it was right. Even if those that didn't have the right business model failed. But here we are creating out of vaporware stuff that is not a currency, is not an asset, is nothing. It's just totally shit coins, literally shit coins. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's an insult to, to, to shit, to call them shit coins, because, you know, manure is actually very useful in agriculture uh, for, as a fertilizer. This stuff is totally useless. Not only is useless, not only is worth zero, it's worth negative because there is a toxic externality of doing hundreds of thousands of computers, endless algorithms just to have a bet of winning something. So given the externalities of pollution of the environment, the true value is not zero, it's negative if we had the right uh, Pigovian externality tax on them. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. That's the entire, it's, it's, it's systemic, it's everybody. Is everybody really SBF is the rule? People say, Oh my god, SBF is the rule. They're all crooks. I know them, they're all total crooks. Mm -hmm. Well, I did notice you did talk about cryptocurrencies in the book in chapter six. Um, and I noticed you had bold text explaining like what a true currency is. Um, and I know you and I've talked for a few years now, and I, I do know you have been critical on cryptocurrency. So thank you for giving us uh, an update there. I want to talk about the um, mega threat of uh, financial instability and what you're looking for there. Well, there are different dimensions of financial instability. I, I talk about it in part uh, in Chapter 4, when I speak about uh, how easy money has led us to a, a debt trap and how easy money and easy credit has led to boom bubbles that then eventually go into a bust and a crash with a financial crisis. But then chapter six, I speak also about more systemic uh, uh, financial instability. Of course, I criticize the entire crypto, but luckily it's not a mega threat. A crypto went from a $3 trillion value two years ago to less than a trillion today, and nothing has happened. It could go to zero. Unfortunately, millions of people, retail suckers, are going to lose their shirts, but it doesn't have any systemic effect because even with its leverage, it's contained to its system. It's not yet involving the traditional financial system. Unfortunately, of course, you know, Madoff at the Ponzi scheme, about 30,000 people lost their savings. FTX alone was 1 million people. 40 million Americans have some crypto exposure, and most of them bought crypto not when it was 100 Bitcoin, but when it was 69,000 last November, right? 99% of people who got into crypto got it uh, at prices that are way above what they are today, so they lost their shirt. So it's millions of people that are subject to a Ponzi scheme, not a few thousand people like Madoff. Is made off to the power of 10, right? But it doesn't have a systemic effect. While other things like the risk of uh, uh, the dollar losing uh, its role as a global reserve currency, uh, the risk of having a systemic financial crisis that wipes out a large part of the shadow banking system or the non-shadow one, there is the risk of systemic defaults, the risk of threats to the viability of the Eurozone, those are financial risks that are much more severe, much more systemic, that under some circumstances, uh, they could materialize. And of course, you have to discuss them one by one. But there's a broader concern about uh, systemic financial instability. It has nothing to do with crypto. Crypto can disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow, literally, and nothing is going to happen. It's not a mega threat. That's the only good news about it. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, let me ask you just real quick, though, on the um, U.S. dollar and your thoughts there as it relates to its status as the global reserve currency. What is kind of your thought process on the U.S. dollar? Well, um, the global monetary system has been based since World War II on the dollar. First, we fixed exchange rate, the gold exchange standard. And since the breakdown of it, uh, we flexible exchange rate still, the U.S. is the major global reserve currency. You know, there were proposals to make it multipolar at Bretton Woods, uh, Keynes uh, Banker proposal. Then the IMF created the SDR. Then we added the RMB to the SDR. The idea was we have a multipolar world. We shouldn't be relying only on the U.S. dollar. And there are other ideas along the same lines. We have never moved from a unipolar to a multipolar system. But I think that rather than moving from unipolar to multipolar, we're going to move to a bipolar system. Because now you have a rising power, China, that has an economic, trading, financial, monetary, technological, FDI, political and geopolitical system that is uh, different from the one of the West. And, uh, and whether we like it or not, uh, will become a bipolar world where there is US, Europe and the West and their friends and allies on one side, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, Cambodia, and their own friends and allies. And many of them might be emerging markets that have no choice but going with China rather than going with the West. So we we'll live a divided world, decoupled, fragmented, balkanized in every aspect, economics, trade, FDI, technology, data, information, and even currency system. So, and in the area that is dominated by China, I think that China is going to be able to have his own currency used as a unit of account, means of payment, store of value, vehicle currency, and uh, main reserve currency, and, uh, and numerator for transactions. It's going to happen only gradually, but it's going to happen. So in that world, uh, the role of the US dollar is going to decline relative to the one of the Chinese currency. Secondly, we're weaponizing the US dollar today, imposing sanction, trade and financial against our strategic rivals, initially North Korea, then Iran, big time on Russia. And it's only a matter of time we're going to do it on China. So those countries have to move away from dollar assets because those dollar assets can be seized by the US and the West. As they say, if I owe you a billion, it's my problem. If I owe you a trillion, it's your problem. And China is a problem because it owns one trillion of US treasuries. And if there was a war or something, we could default or seize them or freeze them, like we did with Russia. So, and in the past, people say, well, if it's not dollar, I'm going to go into euro and yen. But with Russia, we realize we can seize also the euro and the yen of our strategic rival. So, which is the only global reserve asset that is used widely, but probably cannot be seized by the West if there is a conflict? Uh, probably is gold. Of course, not gold in the vault of the New York Fed or the UK in London, but gold in the vaults of whatever bank or central bank in Moscow and Beijing. So if that happens and uh, these countries have to move away from dollar assets, then they're going to de-dollarize. The value of the dollar is going to fall. The value of gold, for example, is going to be higher. So we'll have a process of de-dollarization. They could also lead to a disorderly fall in the value of the dollar. That's one of the risks. We already have large twin fiscal and current account deficits in the U.S. In Europe, you have fiscal deficit, but you have current account surpluses. In U.S., you have those twins. The only reason why we could finance it was because interest rates were high and rising because of the Fed. But if the Fed's going to wimp out, the financing of that twin deficit is going to go away. Rates are going to go higher, and uh, our ability to finance ourselves is going to be reduced. Yeah. So that that's also can weaken the dollar and people move away from dollar assets. So, so it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, rightly so, Larry Summers says, for now, the dollar is king because, you know, he says uh, uh, Europe is a museum. 
Japan is in hospice and China is a prison. So there is no clear alternative to US dollar, All right? And that's true. Uh, we are the, dirt, uh, the least dirty shirt uh, in, a, in, a, in a room of very dirty shirts or we are the valedictorian in, uh, in summer school. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually the Chinese and the Chinese currency is gonna partially replace us. And I see more a bipolar world rather than unipolar or a multipolar when it comes to global reserve currency status. Yeah, it is the Tina. There is no alternative right now for the US dollar. Right. Um, you mentioned, but oh, sorry. You mentioned gold. Um, and like in this kind of scenario, gold would go higher, the dollar would fall. Do you want to, let me ask you this just real quick. Do you want to own gold right now for this kind of mega threat uh, scenario that you put forth? Is that kind of like the safe haven to be in? It's one one of the safe havens, uh, not the only one. You want to be probably overweight in gold for various reasons. I mean, this year gold didn't do very well. You know, it went in the last few years from 12 to 2000 and then, it fell 10, 15 percent. But this year, the Fed was raising rates and the dollar is becoming stronger. And gold depends on like any commodity on the value of the dollar and on real rates. When real rates are higher, the dollar is stronger. The dollar value of commodities, including gold, falls. But if I'm right, the central bank going to blink and wimp out and inflation goes higher. As I said, not much higher, but even from two to six, seven percent, then gold is going to do well. And when the Fed and other central banks wimp out, uh, the dollar is going to weaken and real rates are going to fall. So that's going to be good for gold. It's historically hedged when inflation is high, like the 70s. It's also a hedge against political and geopolitical risk. Political because, you know, if you have a social turmoil at home, civil war, violence, people like to put some gold and lock it up somewhere. Geopolitical because of what I just discussed. Uh, those who have dollar assets will have to move away from them. Where they're going to go has to go in gold. Additionally, if there is a financial crisis and you're worried about the value or of even of your bank deposits, gold looks safer, as it happened during the GFC. And, uh, and therefore, all these factors suggest that, you know, precious metals, including gold, over time can go higher. Again, overweight, I'm not saying that most of your wealth should be in gold, but you probably want to be overweight. Mm. And this year was a difficult year for gold, but it was a difficult year for uh, most assets, right? This year, public equity went down, private equity went down, growth, VC, and tech stocks went down even more because they're long duration assets, more sensitive to long rates. Of course, all the bubble of Mimi and SPACs and crypto went bust 80%. REITs went down, bonds went down in price, yield went up, credit spreads wide and the price fell. Even cash gave you a negative real return because of inflation. So a portfolio that hedges against the risk that I see of inflation being higher has some gold and precious metals, maybe even green metals, because in this green transition, lithium, cobalt, zinc, and those things are gonna be in demand and the supply is constrained. You want to be in short-term treasuries that reprice when interest rates are higher without having the fall in their market price because they are short duration as opposed to long duration bonds that lose market value when yields are higher. You want to hold some tips and inflation index bonds. And you want to be in sustainable real estate because real estate is a good hedge against inflation where inflation is moderately high and real rates are falling. But a good chunk, even of North America, is going to be damaged by hurricanes, floods, sea rise level, uh, uh, you know, wildfires, droughts, and you name it, heat. So you want to be in parts of the U.S., like Midwest, into Canada, that are uh, resilient to climate change. There's lots of trillions of dollars of real estate assets are going to be stranded. So you have to find the right types of real estate. So short-term treasury, tips gold, precious metals, green metals, and the right types of real estate. That's a portfolio that hedges you. Because, you know, historically, 60-40, 70-30 risk parity works because the correlation between the price of bonds and equity is negative. Risk on, risk off, growth recession. But that assumes that inflation is low. When inflation is even 
gradually rising, you lose money in your equities and other risky assets because the discount factor for those dividends, the long rate is higher, but the higher long rate means that the price of the bond is lower. So this year, you lost more money on safe bonds than on equities because the yield went from one to four. So you lost 25% on 10-year treasuries uh, while you lost only 15 on the S&P. So the correlation became positive and it's going to continue to be positive if inflation is going to keep on rising. Say, if I'm right and inflation is six, then 10-year treasury have to be eight. Today, they're 3.6. From 3.6 to eight, you have another 50% fall in the price of those bonds. So people who don't have financial literacy don't realize that bonds can be as risky or more risky than equities that they think of them as being safe. One, they're not safe because some countries default, so there is sovereign risk. But even countries like US that don't default, if the yield goes higher because of inflation, the price falls, the inverse relation than the yield and the price. So you can lose more money on safe bonds than you lose on equities. That's why 60-40, 70-30 risk parity failed this year, because when inflation is rising, that's what happened. I wrote about it over a year ago when that was not conventional wisdom. I said, worry, watch out, inflation is going to rise. You're going to lose money on bonds and on equities. Nobody listened. And this year has been a bloodbath across the board, even for safe bonds. Yeah. Um, I think people probably are are listening uh, now, Noriel, because you have you've made many um, great calls in your career uh, and they and they have transpired and they have played out. Um I guess we only have like maybe 15 more minutes or so. So I just want to use my time wisely. But you were also talking, or you've written about this too in the book, um, geopolitics, uh, the end of globalization. I guess maybe like what is sort of your big picture um, view of the world, how it might change, and some of the uh, broader implications or maybe implications like how it might affect everyday folks who are watching and listening. Well, you know, the big picture is that, you know, as I said, I'm 64. You're much younger and many of the audience probably are also younger, smart men and women. But, you know, I was born in Istanbul, in Turkey in 1958, and we moved to Iran, Israel, Italy. So I grew up between Middle East and, uh, and Europe from the late 50s until 83, when I came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D., first 25 years of my life. Now, most people don't remember that period because they were not even alive, right? Or barely born. But, you know, when I was growing up in Italy, uh, I never worried really about uh, war among great nations or great powers or nuclear war. Because, you know, in the 70s, where the detente between US and the Soviet Union, Nixon went to China, and the risk of war between US, Soviet Union, and China was already low, became even lower. Not zero, but definitely. Last thing you worried about was uh, that. Yeah, there were proxy wars, Afghanistan, Mozambique, and Angola, but no US soldier killed the Soviet and vice versa. So, and today instead we have a geopolitical depression where you have four revisionist power, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all of them with the bomb, including effectively uh, China today, fifth one being Pakistan, their allies. We already have a hot war between Russia and Ukraine, could become unconventional and involve NATO. Israel could attack Iran because it's an existential threat for them. US and China could go to war over Taiwan. The head of the US Navy a few weeks ago said the risk of that happening is high, not 10 years from now, but he said it could happen before 2024. Guess what? We're at the end of 2023. Before 2024 is 2023, next year. So we already have a hot war, a cold war. Getting colder could become hot. And finally, that little dictator in North Korea says, me too, me too, because the tensions on Ukraine, Iran, and Taiwan. So he's sending every other day rockets in the sea of, uh, of Japan or over South Korea. So the risk of war is severe. Two, when I grew up, never worried about climate change. Temperatures were below, barely above pre-industrial levels, 60s and 70s. So it was not an issue. 
I never worried about uh, pandemic. I never even heard about global pandemics. The last one had been 1918. Today, climate change is a disaster, is accelerating, and the risk of it is not damaged 20 years from now. But look what's happening every other day. Hurricane and floods and droughts and wildfires and sea level rises and disaster and economic costs are huge. And the fact that now, suddenly, we had no pandemic within 1918 and uh, 1980. Since then, suddenly, we had HIV, SARS, MERS, swine flu, various episodes of bird flu, Zika, Ebola, COVID-19, monkeypox. It's only a matter of time we're going to have COVID-23 or 24 even more deadly. Why suddenly in the last uh, four decades we have all this repeat the global pandemic? It's still with climate change. As we destroy the animal ecosystems, those animals who carry pathogens like pangolin, bats and other get closer to livestock animals and to humans. And therefore the zoonotic transmission from animal to human become more frequent as we encroach on their ecosystem urbanization and damaging the environment and so on. That's why we're seeing massive amount of them more frequent, more virulent year after year. It's to do with climate change. When I grew up, I never worried about AI destroying my jobs. We're in the middle of an AI winter, right? Little theory, but no practice. I never worried about deglobalization or trade wars or balkanization or decoupling. We had the first GATT, then WTO, then the European Union, then NAFTA, and then we had hyper-globalization with the collapse of Soviet Union and all this country joining the global market and labor supply, not just the Soviet Union, but also China, India, and all emerging markets. I never worried about the Great Depression because there were mild recessions and the business cycle was just mild. Yes, we had the stagflation of the 70s followed by three decades of uh, great moderation. I never worried about debt crisis because debt ratios, private and public, were low and growth was strong. Uh, I was never worried about implicit debt because they had growing young populations of workers and the age were low. So there was no problem of unfunded liability. I never worried about financial crisis because we had the good regulation supervision of the bank, financial repression, capital control, and we did not have that toxic uh, financialization we've seen in the last few decades. And finally, at least in the West, we lived in liberal democracy. Yeah, there were center-right parties, center-left, but nothing like the kind of polarization and partisanship there today, and nothing like the extremist, radical, populist party of extreme right and left coming in power all over the world. This was the world between 1945 and the mid-80s. Today, all these things are new mega threats. So we tend to project the future as if it's going to be the recent past. And we had a few decades of relative peace, progress, and prosperity. But actually, the world today looks more the period between 1914 and 1945, when in spite of the first Industrial Revolution, in spite of the first era of globalization, we ended up with World War I and then the Spanish flu, and then the stock market crash of 29, and then the Great Depression, and then inflation, deflation, hyperinflation, trade wars, currency war, debt crisis, financial crisis, unemployment 25%, and then Nazis came to power in Germany, fascists in Italy, Franco in Spain, authoritarian militaries in Japan, and then we ended up with World War II and with the Holocaust. And by the way, that was a dark 30 years, but in those 30 years, there was no problem with climate change. Today is a mega threat, bigger than it was then. There was no problem with climate change. There was no risk of AI at that time, right? It was even a concept. There were no computers. And World War II was ugly and nasty. Millions of people died, but guess what? It was a conventional war. It ended with the US luckily getting the bomb rather than Nazis, and we has destroying Hiroshima and Nagasaki and creating the nuclear era. But next time there's gonna be a conflict between great powers, it's not gonna be conventional. It's gonna to escalate to unconventional in a matter of months. So there are three mega threats on climate, on AI, on the risk of nuclear winter that did not even exist 
in that tragic period between 1914 and 1945. So I would say the risks are even more severe than that. So that's the world we're living right now. And it's very different from the world we live in the last few decades. If you were around like I was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and early 80s, yeah. it's a radical shift. There are mega threats like we have never seen before. Yeah. I mean, when you say that period 1914 to 1945, and you outline all of those events that happened, and then you put on top of that um, these new, the three new mega threats that you mentioned the AI displacing jobs, um, the threat of nuclear war, and, um, and cl climate, climate change. Let me ask you this because. A lot of folks call you Dr. Doom. In the book, I know you, you say that the moniker really should be more like Dr. Realist. In the whole span of your life and career, would you say that this is like the most severe, severe worrisome scenarios that you've experienced or have contemplated or thought about? Yes, it is, because then you usually, I'm an economist, I believe in the concept of comparative advantage that says, stick to what you know and shut up about everything else. And usually I've always written about economic, monetary, and financial issues, upside, downside risk, of course, financial crisis. But I realize we live in a world in which uh, there are social risks, there are political risks, there are geopolitical risks, there are environmental risks, there are health risks, there are trade related risks that technological risk, and they're all interconnected. As I said, it's a 10 by 10 matrix. And unless you take a holistic approach and connect them all and realize this, we have to face them not individually, but also collectively together, then we're going uh, in a very, uh, very wrong direction. We may not end up there. There is a dystopian chapter. There's one that's more utopian. But uh, as I said in the epilogue, um, the dystopian uh, scenario to me looks more likely today than the utopian one. Explain there's the dystopian. A between, yeah. a, there's a difference between a normative statement and a positive. Normative is about how the world should be, what's desirable and optimal. And of course, we like to be in the utopian. But then a positive is about what's more likely to be. So I would love us to end up in the utopian. But right now, we're more likely in the dystopian. Now, I'm not... a permanent pessimist, I think that we decide our own fate, the things we can do. And I see my book as a call to wake up. I mean, we're living like zombies. We've been sleepwalking into disaster. Every time uh, there is the alarm saying, hey, wake up, we push the snooze button. And we keep on kicking the can down the road. We keep on putting our head in the sand like ostriches. And these threats are becoming bigger and bigger and more interconnected. So I'm telling people, wake up. Because, you know, in the very stages of depression, uh, the first one is denial, then is anger, then there is a resignation, and then you start therapy and you get yourself out of it. I fear that with mega threats, we're still in the, in the stage of denial, and some people get angry to me. Uh, they blame the messenger. And if you think about it, I've not said anything new. I mean, there are thousands of books on climate change, on pandemic, on AI, on deglobalization, on any one of these threats. I just put them together and I connect the dots. I'm not talking about aliens invading uh, planet Earth or an asteroid hitting us. No one can say that these threats don't exist. People may agree or disagree on one, how severe they are, whether a slow motion or fast motion, what are the potential solution of them, how likely they are politically, economically, technologically, otherwise. But I would say nobody can say I'm talking about crazy stuff. I mean, this is the real stuff on which people have written now for decades, right? Yeah. It's just putting it together in a coherent connection that is maybe in a novelty. Yeah. So no one has ever told me that you are talking about lunacy or stuff that doesn't exist. These things exist. Yeah. Everybody recognizes exist. Then we can disagree on how severe they are and what we can do about them. But yeah. it's not it's not it's not science fiction. It's about the world that the way it is right now. Exactly. And a key part of like your title. So the title, Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them. And maybe that's the important part, too, is you said it's a wake-up call. I'm glad we're having this conversation right now. And hopefully folks will go pick up your book because I highly recommend it. How do we survive this? What are the solutions or what are some of the solutions? Well, first, uh, for every 
threat in every chapter I discuss the potential solutions. And then there is a dystopian scenario and more utopian. The point I want to make is that uh, wishful thinking or making a shopping list of what uh, is desirable without considering the feasibility of it technologically, economically, politically, is just nonsense. And a lot of stuff, say, on, on climate change is uh, greenwashing, green wishing, uh, green fig leaves, uh, lots of ESG is just uh, nonsense. They pretend with ESG investment, but it's not. And most of these white papers on reaching net zero for businesses and corporates and banks are written by their PR department, not by really those who know what's going on. So it's a call of saying, let's to call the bullshit a little bit down and say wishful thinking and hoping and praying that there's something by miracle is going to happen is not going to resolve our problem. Let's be honest about it and let's see what the solutions are. And each one of these problems imply sacrifices and costs in the short run for the individual and the common good domestically, nationally, and globally in the medium long term. And either we make those sacrifices individually and collectively in the private and public sector at the national level, international level, otherwise we're going to end up in disaster. Let's be honest. Let's not pretend that this uh, silver bullet is going to resolve this problem. They all imply sacrifices, spend less today, consume less today, and invest in our future so that our future is going to be a better future. And then the question is, are we going to do it or are we not going to do it? So th that's, that's what the book is all about. So the world is not deterministic. And by the way, in the past, what saves us was not the good leadership. People say if we had a really strong leader in the private and public sector, that's again is wishful thinking. Is technology. And by the way, in the book, in the utopian chapter, I say the beginning of a solution of this problem with the environment has to do with finding sources of energy that are unlimited, cheap, with zero greenhouse gas emission. And I specifically refer to fusion. Now it's all over the press. I wrote about it a year ago. Fusion is the revolution. Because I saw the experiments at MIT and I saw it coming. Yeah. So this technology can save us that reduces energy cost, can resolve the climate issue, resolve debt issues and lots of other things by growing the economic pie and so on. So technology is what saves us rather than us humans, uh, whatever. The problem with technology, as I said, is the risk of uh, permanent technological unemployment the risk of increasing income and wealth inequality, and the risk that actually technology often are created by governments to fight bigger wars, right? Bigger weapons and bigger wars. So those technology revolutions give the lead to World War I, to World War II, and now to even more deadly weapons. So there is a dark side of technology that is, do we use it for making the world better, or do you use it to fight bigger wars that are going to destroy us. So we have to be cautious, not say technology is a miracle, can be helpful if we use it right. So the hope is not in humans, paradoxically, is it technology helping us to achieve a better future. If we use technology right, and we don't let it dominate us if we for use it right, yeah. bad causes. Yeah, well, Noriel Rubini, I really enjoyed this conversation. I always learn something from you, so it was a real treat to have you for 90 minutes. It's such a treat to have you. Um, I just want to quickly pass it back to you. Do you want to let no folks know where they can find you, maybe on social media or, you know, read more of your work or obviously pick up the book as well? I'll just give you a couple minutes. No, thank you. Well, I'm all over Twitter. My handle is uh, at uh, Nouriel, my first name. Uh, that's where I comment on stuff. Uh, you find some of my other stuff on nurialrubini.com. I write a monthly column for Project Syndicate, projectsyndicate.org. Uh, you need to subscribe, but it's a reasonable subscription. I give talks, and uh, if you search for my name uh, on YouTube and on other media, I've done lots of interviews and podcasts talking about the books, the book and the idea that I I write about. And of course, I have also an economic consultancy, but that's for high end clients like uh, institutional investors rather than retail. However, for retail investors, I have also a service called the boombust.com that provides uh, both qualitative and quantitative ideas together with my colleague uh, David Brown, 
on how you could invest that as well. So there is, a, there is also slightly more retail related product. I'm also getting involved for the first time in my life in a asset management firm it's called Atlas Capital that wants to provide a hedge against the stale risk of inflation, the basement of fiat currencies, social, political and geopolitical instability and environment along the line of those investment idea I gave. We just launched an index and from there the next few months we may derive an ETF. If and when there's ETF will be a product available to retail investors as well. So there are ways of hedging against those risks uh, by the strategy that I discussed as well. So, and I give talks and lectures uh, all over the world. So you can see me, you cannot hide from me. <laughs> Love I'm it. A bit everywhere. Noriel Rubini, Professor Emeritus of Economics at NYU Stern and the author of the new book, Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them. I thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your ideas. And it was great to see you again. Thank you again, Noriel. Great seeing you, Julia. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Hey everyone, I really hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe, and that bell so you won't miss any new videos.